In 2004, Borussia Dortmund needed a 2 million euro loan from Bayern Munich just to help pay their players' wages. It was a remarkable situation. Firstly, because of who was giving the help, but secondly, because today Borussia Dortmund are a model of sensible investment and one of the better run clubs in Europe. So, how did they almost reach the point of near ruin? In 1997, Dortmund summited the European game. Under Ottmar Hitzfeld, they won the Bundesliga in 1995 and 96, and most memorably, via goals from Karl-Heinz Riedl and Lars Ricken, they beat Juventus in the Champions League final of 1997. It was an era backed by aggressive spending and generous wages, though. Matthias Sammer had been signed from Inter Milan for £3.8 million in 1992, Riedl had arrived from Lazio for £4 million in 93. Andreas Muller returned to Germany from Juventus for another £4 million in 94, and Heiko Herrlich joined from Borussia Mönchengladbach in 95. All four deals established new Bundesliga transfer records. On reflection, the irony of Ricken, an academy product scoring his famous goal against Juventus and becoming emblematic of that triumph, is that one of Dortmund's problems during the era was their failure to produce homegrown players. He was one of the very few graduates during the 90s with the club instead buying their quality off the rack to ensure the team's evolution. As a result, in the years after winning the European Cup and under the leadership of President Gerd Niebaum and business manager Michael Mayer, Dortmund spent extravagantly to capitalise on and sustain their success. £13.5 million went in 1998, including on Bakarusello, Didi and Jens Lehmann. A vast £24 million was spent the year after in recruiting, among others Christian Vaughns, Viktor Ekpeber, Ivan Ilsen and Freddy Bobic. And the club would then break the German transfer record twice more in successive summers. First for Thomas Rizicki in 2000, then for Brazilian forward Amoroso the year after. All told, between 98 and 2001, in addition to many player contracts renegotiated in the light of success, Dortmund had spent in excess of £170 million and recouped just £37.3 million in sales. And there were other expenses too. The club had also attempted to capitalise on their domestic success by expanding the Westfalstadion. Most grounds in Germany were still owned by regional governments at the time and depended on public money for redevelopment. But in the first case of privately financed stadium development in German football, additional tiers were added to the East and West stands after winning the Bundesliga in 95 at a cost of 60 million Deutschmarks. After capturing the European Cup, the southern and northern ends of the ground were also expanded for a further 40 million, taking the ground's capacity to nearly 69,000. All of which was fine, of course, but only if the club's success on the pitch continued. Title success became the norm and Champions League qualification and its revenue was guaranteed each year. And it wasn't. After six years in charge, Otmar Hitzfeld stepped aside after lifting the European Cup and became director of football. And that preceded a tumultuous period of change and flux. Dortmund were managed by five different coaches between 97 and 2000, and they wouldn't re-qualify for the Champions League again until 2002 when Bayer Leverkusen's collapse handed them an unlikely Bundesliga. It was a strange period. In his book, Building the Yellow Wall, Uli Hesse describes a changing attitude in the Westfalstadion and a creeping arrogance at odds with Dortmund's people's club reputation. Among the squad, too, fractures and factions began to grow in the late 90s. During more divided moments, players who had joined the club from Serie A teams would reportedly speak Italian to each other on the training ground rather than German, as egos and agendas began to clash. As perilous as Dortmund's financial situation became during that period, it was actually more complex than it ever appeared. In an attempt to increase short-term revenues, Nybaum and Meyer had, in the words of The Athletic's Raphael Honigstein, used every trick in the book to keep the club afloat and hide the true extent of the crisis. Those other, sometimes curious details included selling the stadium to an investment fund in a hazardous sale and leaseback deal. It was a scheme designed to pay for another costly upgrade. By filling in the Westfalen Stadion's corners, it was hoped that it would become a profitable host for games during the 2006 World Cup, and the 75 million euro sale was the club's way of financing the project. In an act of part creativity and part hubris, they'd also attempted to cut out the middleman of kit supply by launching their own sportswear company. 
It too, however, would be sold and leased back at considerable cost. And as part of the same agreement, the rights to the club's badge and name was also vended. When that detail was finally revealed in 2005, it was a scandal that drew a thousand strong supporter protests before a game with Bochum. And in another issue, which came to light years later, it was revealed that they had received a 15 million euro loan from a property magnate named Albert Sala, and that the loan had been secured against the transfer rights of three players, including Thomas Rizicki. Other factors, sometimes outside of Dortmund's control, also contributed to their financial demise. In October 2000, they became the first German club to profit from new legislation which allowed sports clubs to run their football arms as PLCs, selling an initial 13.5 million shares and earning around £95 million. However, in 2002, German media mogul Leo Kirch was declared bankrupt and his premier channel, a major Bundesliga rights holder, fell into insolvency, leaving holes in the accounts of clubs all over Germany. For Dortmund, an unlikely Bundesliga champion in 2002, the worst was still to come. They would finish third in 2003 and be eliminated in a qualifying playoff ahead of the Champions League group stage. Moreover, they would suffer early elimination after tumbling into the UEFA Cup and suffer another major loss of revenue, probably as much as 30 million euros in the process. So, while the famous anecdote of the episode is of course that Bayern Munich loan in 2004, that 2 million euros was really just a drop in the ocean of such grave dysfunction. In October of that year, the extent of the turmoil was revealed. Despite the issuing of sales and new shares, and the devaluing of the share price as a result, the club reported a six-month loss of nearly 70 million euros and a debt of nearly 120. Nybaum would resign, the club badge and name scandal did it for him, rather than the debt. He was replaced by Hans-Jürgen Watzke, then the parent club's treasurer, in February 2005. Watzke is still CEO of Borussia Dortmund today, and he oversees a very different sort of club. In those first few months, however, his role was to construct and sell a recovery package to the more than 60 creditors, including the 100-strong investment group that owned the club's stadium. And that's the beginning of a different story. The one about Jurgen Klopp, his heavy metal football, and a journey which would end with a Bundesliga title again and another European Cup final. It was, however, very close to not happening. Had the club's creditors not been convinced to accept the recovery plan and the staggered repayment of their debts, Borussia Dortmund, who flew far too close to the sun and lived well beyond their means, might not exist in their current form. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. And if you do enjoy TIFO, then you'll probably also like The Athletic. If you watch our tactics videos, you should go and read Michael Cox. If you're into data, read Mark Carey. And if you're into transfers, it's David Ornstein. Plus, if you're a fan of any Premier League team, then there's a journalist dedicated to you, and you can try it for free for 30 days now by clicking the link in the description.